No matter what culture you belong to, what religion you believe, what society, what level of wealth or era you live in, one thing is common to all people and that's the, that they want to be happy. Happy in their marriages. Especially happy in their marriages because that is the common relationship. Doesn't matter what country, what religion, what place you are, people are married. And people want to be happy in that relationship. Christians want this, Jews want this, Muslims want this, black, white, yellow, red people, everybody wants to be happy in their marriage. I have never heard a new bride or groom rub their hands together and say, boy, I can't wait for the divorce. Now I have to admit that I've seen, you know, <laughs> I've seen couples looking like a train wreck on their way to a divorce. They didn't know it. But I've never seen anyone or heard anyone that actually wanted to fail at their marriage. Nobody wants to do that. You know, even if your son or daughter marries the sorriest loser, the worst match possible in your eyes, what do parents end up saying anyways? Well, I hope they'll be happy. Reminds me of the old joke, behind every successful man there stands a very surprised mother-in-law, but that's a, whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other sermon, I think. And why do people want to be so happy in marriage? Well, because this relationship has the power to make us extremely happy or extremely sad. It affects everything. We want to be happy in marriage because we often measure our success in life by how well we succeed in marriage. We use marriage to give ourselves value. We want to be happy because we don't get many chances to get it right and for some they never get the chance. And there's so much pressure on us to succeed in marriage. Our parents, our children, our religious beliefs, society in general, our work and career, everybody is hurt or disappointed if we fail in marriage. If we go to work and we announce to our workmates, yeah, my wife filed for divorce, nobody goes, oh, way to go, man. Nobody, nobody does that. Nobody's happy when, when they hear someone else fails in marriage. You know, a lot of people want to be happy because they want to duplicate the happiness and level of contentment that they saw in their parents' marriage or their grandparents' marriage. They see this as an ideal and they want to fulfill that in themselves. Others want to be happy in marriage because they've been unhappy growing up, or they've been unhappy as single persons, perhaps unhappy in a previous marriage. They want to experience something that they've missed out on, and they hope that marriage is going to supply that happiness. And finally, people want to be happy in marriage because, well, they've been told that they're going to be happy, and that they should be happy when they marry the one that they love. So there's a great expectation of happiness when we say, I do. And for all of this expectation and hope of happiness in marriage, the sad reality is that many couples do not attain this prize that they covet so greatly when they take their vows. According to a survey done of couples in North America trying to determine the level of success in marriage, the following picture emerged, 50% said, that they couldn't resolve issues and they ended up divorcing. 25% acknowledged that their marriage was based on convenience. Well, we got the kids, we have no choice, too proud to break up, to family, religious pressure keeping us together. 15% of respondents said that they were generally satisfied with their marriage. 10% answered the survey by saying that they were very happy and they wouldn't change a thing. Although 100% of people want a happy marriage, the actual number of people who actually accomplish this is far lower. Of course, caveat here, of course, this particular survey did not focus on Christian marriages where I suspect the numbers of those being happy probably a lot higher. In any case, I believe that God wants everybody to have a successful marriage, especially Christians. Now before talking about how to create a happy marriage, that's the title of the sermon. I want to briefly review exactly what happens when two people marry, because a lot of times people don't realize what they're doing when they get married. 
I mean, there are significant changes that take place when you get married, and understanding these will help when consciously trying to build a happy married relationship. In other words, you need to understand what actually happens to you when you marry before you actually begin the process of trying to be happy. So here are four things that actually happen when you say I do. Number one, you create a new legal status. You now have a union recognized by law and by society. Some people say, well, we've been living together three years, same thing. No, it's not. I tell people, you know, living, well, we've been living together five years, we've been together, what's the difference? Don't need a lousy piece of paper? I said, really? And if you get mad, right, yeah, and you have a big argument, yeah, 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 and you say, I'm done, I'm out of here, can you, can you just leave? Yeah, sure. And why can you just leave? Well, because we're not, oh yeah, because we're not married. Yeah, I can just get up and go. So there's a difference. When you marry, you've signed a contract. You have formalized a relationship. Second thing that happens to you when you get married, a new relationship begins. You are now part of an exclusive lifetime relationship. That's what you've done when you got married. You said, I want to be your husband. I want to be your wife for life. And I'm willing to sign a legal document to that truth. So you got to change your Facebook profile when you get married. Number three, a new role begins for you. You will now take on the responsibilities that you didn't have before. Other people see you differently than they did before. Before you were just Joe, but now you're Joe and Mary. You are Joe and Mary together. When anybody ever looks at Joe, they cannot look at Joe without seeing Mary too. And whenever they look at Mary, they cannot look at Mary without seeing Joe because you're now a new thing, you're a new creature, you're a new thing. A new role begins and ultimately you're a husband, you're a father. You're an in-law, you're a son, you know, these new things happen. And then fourth, a new family begins. You leave your old family to begin a new one which will take precedence over the old family. Number one problem in especially young married life, she can't let go mom or dad. He can't let, usually he can't let go mom. When we marry, our partner becomes the priority over our family. That's not because we like it that way, that's because that's what the Bible says. We leave our mother and father and we cleave to our husband, our, our wife. A new family starts, a new priority begins. So when people marry and organize you know, a wedding ceremony and all the associated activities, what they are doing is symbolizing with vows and rings and songs and prayers and celebrations all of the changes that, are about, that they're about to take place when they marry, the ones that I've just mentioned, and the anticipation of the happiness they will experience as a result of these changes. Why am I going to be happy? Because I have a new legal status. I've made a commitment for life because now I have this new relationship. I have a new identity and role. A new family begins. And these things are going to be the source of my happiness in my marriage. You see, this new exclusive lifetime commitment that brings a new role in identity and family, this is the source of the happiness that all seek in marriage. So when people are unhappy in marriage, it is usually in these areas that the root of their problem lies. For example, perhaps there is doubt or a violation of the exclusivity of one's relationship or there's a wavering as to the length and quality of one's commitment. He starts saying to himself, you know, six months later, whoa, wow, I, I've I, a whole lifetime with this person and only this person. Whoa, man, I should have thought about that. <laughs> and what happens is that his thinking like that begins to creep in his, into his talking and his attitude. Or perhaps one or both partners are confused about their married identities or roles that they are to play. Maybe they begin to 
reject these entirely. You know, the wife, especially the Christian wife, she doesn't like this, this word submission, what that is all about. I don't know what that is all about. And maybe the husband, you know, he's not ready to sacrifice himself for her like Christ sacrificed himself for the church. Wait a minute, what did Christ do exactly for it? Whoa, he died for it. Is the Bible telling me that I need to lay down my life for her? Uh, yeah. Perhaps the burden of family is frightening or too heavy and this is causing hesitation or conflict or doubt. Perhaps some physical or emotional or spiritual change in one of the partners has caused a kind of an imbalance in the relationship. She inherits you know, $500,000 from her grandma, whoops. Can't tell me what to do, I'm wealthy. So whatever the cause for the unhappiness, the solution can usually be found by going back to the basics of what originally created marital happiness in the first place. Let's face it, an exclusive lifetime commitment to an imperfect person by a second imperfect person, that's not an easy thing to accomplish. Because a commitment of this sort is so challenging, couples need to make a constant effort to maintain and improve their relationship. The secret that successful couples who have been happily married for a long time, the thing that they know is that marriages can and do get better with time, but they need time. Unfortunately, a popular misconception is that there is happiness in marriage, but it's only temporary and then you just have to settle for whatever you got. Not true, not true. So many young people think that the best time in marriage is at the beginning and only at the beginning. Great sex, excitement, discovery, all new adventures, everything is new. Let's go get pizza. Yeah, let's go get pizza. <laughs> 20 years later, you call for pizza. No, you call for pizza. No, you call for pizza. Some people envy the Hollywood stars who have the fame and money to repeat the honeymoon period every couple of years. They get married, they have a splashy wedding, blah, 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 they get on People magazine, they got a couple of years together, photo shoot, you know, their honeymoon, their first anniversary, about two years in, whoops, it's over. And they have the money to be able to say, well, I'm, you know, I'll send somebody to pick up my stuff and I'm going to go move to another house that I own and it's over. They get divorced, they start to cycle over again with somebody new and you read about it in the papers three months later, oh, guess who's dating again? What are they doing? They're just repeating the honeymoon cycle over and over and over again. Why? Because they can afford to, that's why. So this has given many the impression that when you get married, this is as good as it gets at the beginning, and then it's only downhill from there, but that's incorrect. We need to understand that marriages by design must improve from where they begin, no matter how happy one feels during those first few months or years, or else the, 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 the marriage will die. In other words, it's got to get better. You got to work at it to make it better. And when this happens, an exclusive lifetime commitment is a joy, not a burden. So in the remaining time that I have this morning, I want to describe four things that every married person can work on in order to improve and create happiness in your marriage. I mean, I could say, here are 40 things to work on, but I picked four, okay? Creating happiness. Everybody receives a basic supply of happiness when they marry. It's like you go to the PX, you know, you get married and they hand you, here's your basic happiness quota. The problem is that many people think that they can live off of that initial deposit of happiness at the beginning of their marriage, that they can live off of that for the rest of their lives. The sobering truth is that we need to continue making deposits into this happiness quota if we want our marriages to continue being happy. 
Now this initial free deposit of marital happiness is generated usually by romantic love, which is composed of three elements. Number one, sexual attraction. This is what usually draws us to one another in the first place, and it sustains our relationship for a time. Number two, similar interests. The couple loves to ski, they like to dance, they want to go to the movies together, or drink, or hang out, or promote ideas, or politics, or they share religious faith. And these things engage us and fill our time with each other for a time. And then of course, idealism. The other person fulfills our ideals about what is good and beautiful, a match for ourselves. She is perfect. And she thinks that I'm perfect. Isn't that wonderful? Eventually, however, most couples learn that if they don't build on these things, they will not be able to sustain that feeling of happiness that their marriage provided for free at the beginning. So in order to build happiness, couples need to work four basic things. I call them the four A's of a successful marriage. A number one, agape, which is the Bible word for love. Not just feelings or emotions, you know, like soap operas, but the kind of love necessary to produce successful marriages, what the Bible calls agape, biblical love that is adapted to the marriage relationship. A definition of agape love, strict definition, quotes, a disciplined commitment towards the well-being of another. That's the definition of agape love. I'll say it again. A disciplined commitment towards the well-being of another. In this case, our marriage partner. So let's analyze this kind of love from that definition. So he talks about, or the definition talks about a commitment, a conscious choice to commit ourselves to another person permanently. When each partner knows that this is the basis of the relationship, they're free to be themselves. They're free to show their weaknesses, to be completely truthful without the fear that the other person is going to run off at the first sign of trouble. I mean, what constitutes marriage in every society is the commitment, not the sex. If it was sex that you know, initiated the marriage, people would be married to a lot of different people. It's the commitment that makes you married. What makes you married is the fact that you have committed yourself to live as a husband or a wife, not just the idea that you've moved in together. Agape type love also has, what the definition says, a disciplined commitment. So dis discipline, discipline, that's self-control necessary if we're to realize the goals of our commitment. Discipline is necessary in order to overcome sexual temptation that occurs in every marriage. Discipline is necessary in order to be kind and patient and forgiving when living with another imperfect person. Love needs discipline in order to stay focused. And then the other part of the, you know, a discipline commitment to the well-being of the partner, the well-being of the partner. The main objective of marriage is not to acquire a house. The main objective of marriage is not to acquire a car or to raise children or to please our parents. The main objective of marriage is the well-being of our partner. I've always told our children as they were growing up, your mother was there first. She will always be first. Always be first. She was there first. You came along after. When this is the objective, all of these other activities, they fall into the right order. So agape love, therefore, is a disciplined commitment towards the well-being of our partners. This is biblical love in marriage. Without this kind of love, marriages cannot succeed. They may last, but they won't succeed. The objective is to succeed and be happy in marriage, not just to make it last 50 years. I know people who have made their marriages last 50 years, but they sure weren't happy about it. 
With agape love, marriage is never long enough. There's never enough time to be with our beloved partner. I've also seen that. I've seen people married 50, 60 years plus, and they're seeing their partner leave in death, and they weep. And their thought is, yeah, we were married 63 years, but it wasn't enough. I wanted 64 years. I wanted 65 years. And you can have that with agape love because it's timeless. Second A in creating a happy marriage, attraction. By attraction, yeah, I mean sexual attraction. A good sex life when health and circumstances permit is a sign and a necessity for happiness and success in a marriage. God is the one who created sex and He created it for procreation purposes and also the pleasure and comfort of the married couple. That means that even after we've had our children, there remains a divine reason for sexual intimacy. Read Genesis 1 and 2. Sex is a powerful force and when it is expressed in marriage, it becomes an act of love, an act of faith, and deeper commitment between the partners. Something that just is a drive becomes a precious and creative force when it is expressed within the confines of marriage. When that same thing is expressed outside of marriage, it becomes a destructive force. From this act, children are born, a sign that sex is good because life comes from it. The trick, of course, is how to maintain that attraction within marriage over a long period of time. I suggest three ways. First, believe God when He tells you that the pleasure that comes from sex is good. Genesis 2.25, they were naked and not ashamed. So many people have a poor sex life because they feel guilty and unspiritual in sexual relationships with their spouses. I mean, feel guilty if you're cheating, but you shouldn't feel guilty for having sex with your spouse. Two, make the other's well-being your major objective within your marriage and especially within your sex life. I mean, sexual feelings are stimulated by kindness and faithfulness and tenderness, generosity, humility, a good sense of humor and other giving virtues. When we work on these kinds of things first, then the physical contact is desirable. I mean, who wants physical contact with a selfish, rude, impatient person, even if they've got a nice body? So what? Jesus said that impure sex and adultery begins in the heart. Well, that is also true of legitimate sex within marriage. It also begins in the heart. And then number three, be available. There's nothing more encouraging or desirable than a willing partner. Not just willing to have sex, but willing to please. Psychologists have discovered that a man's sex drive goes down when he feels assured that his wife is willing to please him. Strange thing, women are always afraid that this, there'll be no end if they give in. Are you kidding me? There'll be no end to it, a bottomless pit. But research shows that when a man is less anxious about this, his needs balance out at a lower level. And when this happens, women are less nervous and they can relax as well and usually end up having a greater desire more often. It's crazy, it's counterintuitive. God knew this principle from the start and Paul's teaching reflects this idea in 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter seven. He says the husband must fulfill, listen to this, the husband, notice the verb here, the husband must fulfill, not if you're feeling like it, if it's a good idea. It says the husband must fulfill his duty 
to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. A man is responsible to please and satisfy his wife's sexual needs, whatever they are, and vice versa. You know, we can't always be equally disposed to have sex. I mean, that's what causes the tension in the first place. But that tension can be used for good if we are always disposed to please our partner. When we say no, we're saying you cannot have what is yours. We cannot have what is divinely yours. So we maintain sexual attraction in marriage by realizing that God is pleased when we give ourselves to our partner without restrictions or negotiations. You know what? You can negotiate or you can trade for sex in a marriage. I see that all the time when I counsel with people. They barter it like it was a commodity. <laughs> they trade for it. Did you do the lawn? Did you trim the hedge too? Okay. So you can negotiate or trade for it, but there's usually no joy in this type of sex. For couples who have trouble being of the same mind when it comes to sex, I want to give you an emotional equation for you to remember. Here it is. Women need, women need intimacy in order to develop a sexual mindset. And men need sex in order to arrive at a state of intimacy with their wives. It's completely the reverse for each individual. For each individual. One mindset is not better than the other. One is not the right mindset and the other is wrong. This is simply an emotional puzzle that couples have to solve so that both partners are satisfied. And until we work this out, it's a very difficult thing to create a lasting and happy and satisfying marriage and a lasting and happy uh, sex life. Number three, A, appreciation. Appreciation. The greatest weakness in men is their lack of appreciation in what being a woman, a wife, and a mother is all about. They just don't get it. And they don't try to get it many times. Of course, I believe women suffer from the same lack of appreciation about men. The difference is that women think they know men because they know what men want. But most women fail to understand the difference between what men are and what men want. They're not the same. By appreciation, I don't mean thank you cards or gifts or flowers on Valentine's Day. I don't mean thanking each other. By appreciation, I mean understanding what each other's roles and responsibilities are and what this does to you as a person. For example, in Christian homes, the Bible teaches us that men and women have different roles. So in Ephesians 5.22, Paul tells us that men are to be the head of the wife and the woman is to be in subjection to her husband, okay? Now a marriage succeeds when the husband works at being the head of the woman with her cooperation. And the wife works at submitting to her husband with the same understanding and cooperation. So a woman needs to understand the responsibility and pressure that a man is under to fulfill his role, or the anxiety at the thought that he's not fulfilling his role. She also needs to help him fulfill his role as leader because not all men are natural leaders. You know, women's big mistake is that they just take over instead of helping him to develop and grow into a leadership role. And men's mistake is they cop out and they let women do it. And the reverse is true for women. Men need to understand how hard it is to assume the submissive position because it is not a natural one. And society, this society, ridicules women who do. 
So when we appreciate or understand the challenges faced by our partner in fulfilling his or her God-given role in marriage, we develop the respect for one another that builds the admiration and loyalty and empathy so necessary to create a successful marriage and the happiness that comes from this success. You know, I want to be able to say, I get my wife and I understand what she has to go through to be a mother and a wife. I understand the, the pressure that's on her and the difficulty. And I'd like to think that she understands what it's like to be a man and to feel the responsibility of leadership in the family and to do a good job with that leadership. And then one more A towards happy marriage and that is aid. If no one ever sinned, every marriage would be successful. However, because we are weak and subject to fall, we need to go to God and go to Him often for divine help. We need help to understand each other. I mean, it's okay, guys, to pray, Lord, please help me understand. Not, Lord, please help her to understand me. Lord, please help me to understand her. Why is this happening? Why is she like this? What is she suffering through that's making this happen? Open my eyes, open my heart. It's okay to ask for help to raise children. It's okay to ask God to help us to manage our money. Ask Him for help to strengthen us through sickness and sin and all the trials we go through in marriage. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Paul encourages couples who are having trouble to do what? To go to God in prayer. You know, many people would rather live in misery than ask for help. Last time I heard, that was called pride. Sometimes we need to ask our partner for help, real help in dealing with physical and emotional or spiritual problems. I have confessed my sins to my wife. I've said to her, listen, you're going to need to pray for me because I'm, I'm this thing here is just tearing me up. It's eating me alive. I need you to go with me in prayer and help me. There's farm aid and flood aid and earthquake aid. Sometimes we need marriage aid. And this aid can come, how? A brother and sister in the Lord to talk to with, ex with experience or you know, a counselor, whatever. Christian couples need to care enough about their relationships that they will seek help when they're in trouble. You know you need outside help when you're no longer able to cope or to resolve the situation by yourself. The successful marriage isn't too proud to ask for help and you know you need help when you cannot make each other happy anymore. I don't know how to make you happy and you have not succeeded in making me happy. Well, maybe we ought to get some help. Of course, this is not, as I said at the beginning, it's not an exhaustive list, but we've reviewed four important things we need to work on constantly if we want better marriages. Number one, agape. Our purpose is the well-being of the other purpose, uh, 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 of the other partner. My spouse is my number one priority in marriage, not my hobbies, not even my job. Not even my job. Not even my job. Number two, attraction. Caring for and giving our bodies to each other in marriage and taking care of our bodies as well for each other. You know, it's never too late to adjust our attitude in this regard. Number three, appreciation. Helping the other to do their God-given job. My wife accepts that I'm the leader in our family and she has helped me to take on that responsibility and to do a better job in that. And, and I understand her great responsibility and hopefully have understood the burden that she has carried all these years as a godly woman and a godly wife and mother. And then finally, aid. Not too proud to ask for help. Next to grace in Jesus Christ, the most precious favor God gives to man is a loving partner. I pray that all here will enjoy better and happier marriages that bless the partners, that enable the children to have happy lives and marriages of their own that will be happy, and of course, in all of these things that give glory to God. And so if there are those here this morning who need help 
with their marriages, or help in their personal lives, or help in coming to Christ for forgiveness. We do invite you to come now, or come later. You know, sometimes coming forward just to book an appointment to see one of the elders for a marriage thing, you don't have to do that, but you can stop any of the elders or ministers. We'd be happy to sit and talk, happy to give you a, perhaps a, a, a reference to a specialist to help you. Whatever your needs are, this is the time that uh, we've set aside to uh, come forward and make those needs known as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we sing?